They say that everyone loves a parade. Let me ask you this morning, do we have any parade fans here today? Any folks that are just absolute fans of parades? Um, I grew up in Canton, Ohio. Canton, Ohio is the home of the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And so every, every year on Hall of Fame weekend, we would have a parade on that Saturday morning. And my family would get up early in the morning on that Saturday morning, and we would make our way to downtown Canton, and we would, we would stake our claim to a spot so we would be in a great spot when the parade went by. And we always like to watch. We'd look for our high school marching band. I went to Jackson High School, and our high school marching band went by. And then there were the animals, and who didn't like the clowns? Everybody loves the clowns. I know when I was growing up, what was special about the parade is we weren't interested in the clowns in that as much as we were the NFL football players that were about to get inducted into the Hall of Fame. And, and we would watch those guys come by in their cars, and my brother and I were avid football fans. We just absolutely loved uh, the parade. Well, even today... I still like a parade. As a matter of fact, on Thanksgiving Day, Vicki and I watch every day. We eat breakfast on Thanksgiving, and we sit and watch the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And, and we like the bands and the clowns and all of those things. There's something about a parade that brings out the child in all of us. Well, today's passage contains a parade. Now, it's not a, uh, a parade in the traditional sense with bands and uh, animals and, well, there are some animals in it, but bands and clowns and floats. But there was a really big crowd in this parade, and there were animals, as we'll see in just a few moments, and there was a grand marshal. As a matter of fact, the grand marshal of the parade was none other than Jesus Christ himself. So this morning, let me ask you to sit back today and enjoy the Jerusalem Passover week parade because that's what we're studying this morning. So if you have your Bibles with me in Luke chapter 19, Luke chapter 19, going to read just a few verses and then we'll come back and study all of them. Luke chapter 19 beginning in verse 36. And as he... Speaking of Jesus, as he rode along, the crowds spread out their garments on the road ahead of him. John tells us that they not only spread out garments, but they, they cut palm branches. And they laid out palm branches. That's why today is known as Palm Sunday. And so as Jesus rode along, the crowd spread out their garments and the palm branches on the road ahead of him. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, there's a road that winds around the front of the Mount of Olives and then makes its way around into the eastern gates. When he reached the place where the road started down the Mount of Olives, all of the followers began to shout and sing as they walked along praising God for all the miracles they had seen. Verse 38, blessings on the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest heaven. If you have an older translation, it might just say what we sang just a few moments ago. Hosanna, Hosanna. The Lord saves, Hosanna in the highest. Would you pray with me today? Lord, as we look at this passage of Scripture, I pray that you would help us to understand it. Lord, help us to understand it not just from a historical perspective, even though we realize that we are, we're reading about history that took place in Jerusalem and history that took place in the nation of Israel. But God, help us to realize how these verses impact us. Help us to understand what was transpiring. Lord, the magnitude of what was taking place in, in this processional, in this parade. God, I pray you'd help us to understand who as we mentioned, the grand marshal was. Help us to understand what Jesus had to do with this parade and uh, 
what this parade had to do with Jesus. As Jesus triumphantly entered into the city of Jerusalem. Help us to understand these passages and help us to to get to know Jesus better this morning. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. We've been going through the book of Luke and unfortunately we haven't been studying every single verse. We've kind of bounced around just for a little bit. And so since we've missed several verses, let me make a few introductory comments that will help us to understand the context of what is taking place here in Luke chapter 19. The first thing that I wrote down, and this is in your notes and it'll be up on the screen, is that the events of this passage conclude Jesus' journey to Jerusalem. I'm not sure whether you've realized it or not, but 11 of the 24 chapters of Luke talk about the events that transpired as Jesus traveled to Jerusalem. If you want to write it down, it actually started, or it's in your notes, it started in chapter 9 and verse 51, which says this, As the time drew near for him, for Jesus to ascend to heaven, Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. So so there in, in Luke chapter 9, Jesus begins walking towards Jerusalem. And basically, for nine chapters... We see what takes place, the things that Jesus taught, the events that occurred as Jesus and his disciples made their way towards Jerusalem. A significant part of this book deals with Jesus' travels to Jerusalem. The second thing that I wrote down that's important is this. The events of this passage transpire during the feast of Passover. Now, to those of us who don't come from a Jewish background, we might not understand the feast of Passover, but to the Jews, especially the Jews of Jesus' time, the Passover was one of Israel's most important holidays. If you've read the Old Testament, you're familiar when, when the Israelites were in bondage in Egypt, God promised to redeem them. God promised to liberate them, to rescue them. And so there on that last plague, God sent the angel of death. And you'll remember the story. The angel of death was to kill the firstborn in every Egyptian household. And God told the children of Israel, he said, I want to protect you. And so so the angel of death won't come to your house. I want you to take the blood of a lamb without blemish. And I want you to, to paint that blood on the doorpost so that when the angel of God comes by and he sees the blood on the doorpost, the angel will what? The angel will pass over your house. And the children of Israel did that, and although the firstborn in all of Egypt was killed, both humans and animals, Israel was spared because of the blood that was on the doorpost, and God passed over those households. And so now, for hundreds of years, Israel has celebrated not only God's liberation, but Israel has celebrated God's protection with a holiday called the Passover. The Passover was celebrated in Jerusalem and people came from all over Israel to celebrate Passover week in Jerusalem. Historians tell us that the population of Jerusalem swelled to almost 2 million people during the Passover. They say this is interesting that more than 200,000 lambs were sacrificed during Passover week. They say that there were portions of the city where the blood ran down the streets as the lambs were sacrificed. So the events of Luke chapter 19 transpire at the beginning of Passover week as all the Jews are coming together to celebrate the Passover. And of course, you and I know how the week ended. The week ended with the death, the burial, and then the resurrection of Jesus Christ that we will study next week. One other thing I want you to catch in this passage though, and this is where it becomes maybe a little bit more relevant to us, because in this passage we see man's propensity to turn away from Jesus when Jesus does not fulfill our expectations. 
Let me pause for a second. You'll see that in the passage in just a few moments. What I mean by that is that we have a tendency to formulate Jesus into who we want him to be. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, sometimes Jesus becomes our own personal ATM machine. And, and we go to God whenever we have a financial need. We go to God and we expect him, just like an ATM machine, to dispense to us whatever we need. For others, God is not a, an ATM machine, but God is a problem fixer. So, so they kind of ignore God in their life until they have a problem. And at that moment, they expect God to, to fix their problem, whatever that problem is is others expect God to be a world peace expert when problems are going on around the world we kind of look to God and say hey come on what's going on isn't your job to, to fix this it's your job to establish peace and then what happens that whenever Jesus does not fulfill our expectations he doesn't give us what we want he doesn't give us what we ask for he doesn't fix the problem that we created and world peace doesn't seem like it's on the horizon many people are tempted to toss Jesus aside just as an old cell phone opting for something else quite frankly that's what we find taking place here in Luke chapter 19 in Luke chapter 20, as Jesus came in, the crowds embrace him. They have an idea of who Jesus is and, and what they wanted Jesus to accomplish. And here, at the first part of the week on Sunday, he is cheered as Hosanna. And yet we realize that just a few days from now, those same people, that same crowd will be cheering and jeering, but they will not be saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. They will be saying, crucify him. Why is that? Because Jesus turned out to be not the Jesus that they wanted. They wanted a liberator, someone who would liberate them from Roman rule, not someone who would give his life on the cross. They didn't want a savior. They wanted someone to liberate them. And so we see that in today's passage. And so we're going to walk through this passage. And so grab your Bibles. We'll put it up on the screen. But let's try to understand what is transpiring and then apply it to our lives. And so we'll go back to verse 28. Notice verse 28. After telling this story, Jesus went on toward Jerusalem walking ahead of his disciples let me just pause Jesus has been walking they've been traveling it's taken days Jesus has told parables Jesus has told stories and as he as he travels he talks and so Jesus and his disciples are now approaching the city of Jerusalem verse 29 as he came to the towns of Bethphage and Bethany on the Mount of Olives he sent two disciples ahead Go into that village over there, Jesus says. As you enter it, you will see a young donkey tied there that, is, that no one has ever written. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks, why are you untying the donkey? Just say, the Lord needs it. So they went and found the colt, just as Jesus had said. And sure enough, as they were untying it, the owners asked them, why are you untying the colts? And the disciples simply replied, the Lord needs it. Now, there's a couple of things that I wrote down that I want us to see today. The first thing that I wrote down that's in your notes is this. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem perfectly fulfills prophecy. As we see in this passage, Jesus' appearance in Jerusalem was not random. Jesus' arrival at the gates of the city was not happenstance. He didn't arrive early. He didn't arrive unexpected. Jesus was punctual. Jesus arrived right on time. As a matter of fact, Jesus arrived at the exact time that the Old Testament prophets had prophesied. Let me give you two illustrations that I wrote in your notes. The first is this. The timing of his arrival perfectly matches 
with the prophecy of Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 and 25. You see, in Daniel chapter 9, the prophet Daniel, hundreds of years earlier, actually 530 years earlier, had been given by God a certain calendar of time, which was marked off precisely to determine the events that were going to transpire to the Jewish people, culminating, or at least part of it culminating, when the Messiah would present himself to Israel. As a matter of fact, I'll put Daniel chapter 9, 25 up on the screen. Here's what Daniel says 530 years before. He says, now listen and understand. Seven sets of seven plus 62 sets of seven will pass from the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem until a ruler, the anointed one, Comes. Let me just illustrate or, or explain what is taking place. The seven sets of seven are periods of years. And so Daniel is, is looking at this, this calendar, maybe different than our calendars look like, but God has given him this picture of this calendar of how events are going to transpire. And he says, here's the way the events are going to transpire. From the time the command is given to rebuild Jerusalem, until the moment that the Messiah comes, a specific amount of years, a specific time is going to take place. Now, if you're a mathematician, we've already sat down, sat down before and done the math at this, and I'd gladly sit down and show you the math. But here's the idea without digging into it too deep today. According to the reckoning of a gentleman by the name of Sir Robert Anderson, former head of Scotland Yard, an English layman with great knowledge of the Bible, the precise date on which Daniel's prophecy was to be fulfilled, guess what day it was? It was the exact day that Jesus marches in to Jerusalem. It's amazing. We sit back and say, Brian, how could that happen? Jesus marched in on the exact day that Daniel prophesied that the Messiah would come. I sit back and read that and I think, wow, now that is called precision. Just sit back and try to calculate that in your minds. That's just like somebody prophesying back in 1475 what was going to take place today, 530 years later. And so as Jesus marches into Jerusalem on this day, it wasn't just a random day. It wasn't just any day that he decided to arrive. This was his day. This was the Messiah's day, the day that the prophet Daniel had foretold. There's a second prophecy that we see clearly fulfilled in this passage, and I, I wrote it this way in your notes. The circumstances of his arrival perfectly match with the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. 9. Now, we've already read the passage. Let me go back and just summarize what takes place. Jesus is approaching Jerusalem. And as Jesus approaches Jerusalem, he sends two disciples ahead of him. And he sent two disciples ahead of him with a mission. He says, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go ahead to that village right over there. And somewhere in that village right over there, there's going to be a colt. There's going to be a young donkey. Not only are they a young donkey, but Matthew tells us that the mother was with the donkey as well. And Jesus says, when you get there, you're going to find a young colt. Not just any young colt, but a young colt with his mother a donkey that has never been ridden before. And I want you to go grab that colt, and I want you to bring it back to me. And oh, 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 by the way, you're going to grab that colt, and as you're untying that colt, someone's going to come to you and say, hey, 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 what are you doing? And you're just going to look at him and say, the Lord needs it. And the guy's going to say, oh, okay, if the Lord needs it, go ahead and take it. The Lord said, this is what's going to take place. And so the text goes through and explains that, that, that everything transpired just as the Lord had told them. Sure enough, they go into that village, they find this, this colt, and the mother tied beside, uh, beside the colt. They untie both of them and begin to walk away, and a couple of guys come and say, hey, what are you guys doing? And they kind of look at each other and say, uh, 
What was, what was, well, the Lord needs it. And the guy said, oh, okay, if the Lord needs it, go ahead and take it. <laughs> and they took the two donkeys and they left. Now, now, that's not just a cool story, but that was actually prophesied in the Old Testament. In Zechariah chapter 9 and verse 9, the prophet Zechariah says this, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Israel. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colts. Jesus perfectly fulfills that prophecy. Now, I wrote down several things in my notes. I'm not sure if I put them in yours, but, but I wrote that this is a great example of the omniscience of Jesus. We talk about Jesus' omniscience. We talk about the fact that, that God knows everything, and Jesus demonstrates his deity here, his omniscience. As he knew exactly what was going to take place. He told the disciples exactly where to go, and he told the disciples exactly what was going to be said to them. Jesus demonstrates his omniscience. But this is not only a great example of Jesus' omniscience, but it's a great example of the sovereignty of God. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? The fact that God is in control. You say, Brian, where do you read that in the passage? Well, think with me for a second. The text goes through, and by the way, this this story is found in all four Gospels. You can find it in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and you get a little bit of a different reading in each of the four Gospels. But several of the Gospels give us a little more description of this cult. They say this, this cult has never been ridden before. So this was a cult that was what? That was not broken. If you know much about animals, colts generally, horses and donkeys, generally need to be broken before they're ridden. So here the guys bring this colt that has not been broken, that has never been ridden before, hand it to Jesus, and Jesus gets on, and how, what happens? The colt bucks him off, right? No, Jesus gets on and rides the colts. Isn't that a cool story, the sovereignty of God? You said, Brian, did that cult know that the creator of the universe was sitting on him? Well, we won't know until we get to heaven. I just do know that Jesus sat on an unbroken, unridden cult before the cult gave him no problem whatsoever, and Jesus was able to ride that cult into Jerusalem. How cool is that? The creator of The universe sits on the back of this cult, and this cult somehow realizes he is transporting his very creator. You see, as we read this story, we see that Jesus' entry in Jerusalem completely fulfills prophecy. I wrote this this in your notes as well. Jesus once again demonstrates that he alone is the Messiah. That's not our topic this morning, but it fits so adequately. Bible scholars say there are more than 300 messianic prophecies attributed to Jesus. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? 300 Old Testament prophecies, the Old Testament prophets looking forward, saying this is what the Messiah is going to say, do, be born, do all of that. 300 specific messianic prophecies, and Jesus fulfills All 300 of them. You say, Brian, is that significant? It's absolutely unbelievable. One Bible scholar by the name of Dr. Peter Stoner wrote a book years ago called Science Speaks. And he wanted to figure out the odds of somebody fulfilling all of the prophecies that Jesus Fulfilled, And he began calculating the odds of, okay, if someone would fulfill eight of the 300 prophecies, and then someone would fulfill 48 of the 300 prophecies, and then somebody would be able to fulfill all 300 of the 300 prophecies. He did some unbelievable mathematical calculations that are way beyond my pay grade that I cannot understand. But he basically said this. He estimated the odds of just fulfilling 48 
of the 300 prophecies. Keep in mind that Jesus fulfilled all 300 of them. This guy figured out the probabilities of somebody fulfilling 48 of the 300. He calculated. He calculated that the odds of somebody doing that were 1 in 10 to the 157th power. You say, Brian, what do you mean by that? Well, let me show you. It's 10 with 157 zeros after it. Can we put that next slide up, guys? That's the probability of somebody, one in that number right there, of somebody fulfilling 48 of the 300 prophecies. You say, so Brian, let me get, are you saying Jesus only fulfilled 48 of them? No, I'm saying that Jesus fulfilled all 300 of them. Over and over again in Jesus' life, he demonstrated the fact that he is, he was the Messiah that was prophesied in the Old Testament. An absolutely uncalculable number. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem fulfills prophecy. Let me show you a second thing as we dig into this. Jesus' entry in Jerusalem prompted spontaneous praise. We read verses 36 through 38 just a few moments ago, and so I won't take the time to receive that or to reread them, but as Jesus enters in, there's crowds. Now remember, the city of Jerusalem swelled during Passover, and so there's hundreds of thousands of people in the streets, and people are flooding their way into the city, and all of a sudden, the people that are flooding their way into the city begin to hear a noise, and, and they look, and here is someone that is riding on a colt, and people are following behind him, singing and they're not just singing any song they are singing the psalms 113 to 118 psalm 113 to 118 is called the hallel it was the songs that that the children of israel sang as they made their way towards jerusalem but they realized that the crowds are receiving jesus in an abnormal way the crowds are receiving Jesus not just as a normal man, but they are receiving Jesus as a conquering king. The, uh, the illustration that is pictured in those that lived during New Testament times would have completely understood what was transpiring. The gathering crowds welcomed Jesus as a conquering king. Now, to be sure, a conquering king would not humble himself to ride on a donkey. A conquering king would normally ride in on a, on a white stallion. Not Jesus, though. Jesus was completely different. I wrote down just a couple of comparisons between Jesus and a normal conquering king. Let me share them to you if you want to write them down. The first thing, Jesus didn't come in wealth. Jesus came in poverty. You see, an average king would come in and they would be flaunting the wealth that he had. Jesus didn't do that. He didn't come in riding a donkey with a, a gold blanket on the top of it, or excuse me, a horse with a gold blanket on the top of it. He came riding a donkey. Jesus didn't come in grandeur, but Jesus came in meekness. Jesus didn't come to slay Israel's enemies. No, Jesus came to save mankind. Jesus didn't come to conquer Rome. Jesus came to conquer sin and death. Jesus didn't come to be crowned. Jesus was entering the city of Jerusalem to be crucified. And although the crowds received him as their conquering king, this was not coronation day for Jesus. It wasn't the throne that was immediately before him. It was the cross that was immediately before him. And so as Jesus enters, they receive him as a conquering king. And the second thing that I wrote is the gathering crowds welcome Jesus with a song of praise. As I mentioned, the song that was sung is from the Hallel, Psalm 113 to Psalm 118. As I mentioned, that was the song that was sung as the Jews traveled on their way to Jerusalem. And here, they're specifically singing Psalm 118, verse 26. You can go back and check it later. The song that is sung acknowledges Jesus as the son of David. Blessed blessings on the king who comes in the name 
of the Lord. John tells us that they specifically were saying, Blessed is the King, the Son of David, who comes. Matthew 21, 9 says, Praise God for the Son of David. Praise God in the highest heaven. And as Jesus comes in, the crowd who has been, we talked about this last week, who, who the Israel, or how the Israelites were expecting this Messiah, this conquering king. And as Jesus comes into the city, the crowd sees him and everyone begins to bow down to him, throw their coats on the road, cut down palm branches. They're treating Jesus as the conquering king. Why? They are calling him none other than the son of David. And the son of David was a messianic title. The people were calling Jesus their Messiah. Yeah, but, by the way, that wasn't a planned worship service. The disciples didn't go ahead and say, okay, now, on Sunday at this time, Jesus is going to be coming in. We need to have the band at this place right over here. We need to have some worship singers right over here. It would be great if we had some dancers that were dancing around, and they orchestrated the entire thing. It wasn't an orchestrated service. It was what? It was a spontaneous worship service. As the Messiah entered into Jerusalem, the crowds spontaneously worshipped him as I was reading through that man I got a little convicted because I asked myself the question and I'll ask you when was the last time that you had a spontaneous moment in which you just paused what you were doing and you recognized who Jesus was that Jesus is was who he claimed to be and at that moment you spontaneously worshipped him whether it was just a shout, praise God, or whether you're driving down the road and you're singing as loud as you possibly can. You ever been driving down the road and you look over and somebody's just singing like crazy? You don't know what they're singing to, but they look, they're at the, they look goofy. They're just sitting there singing like they're the only ones there. Have you ever had one of those moments? I know some of our folks have because they've told me where all of a sudden it's just like God came on them and they realized who God was and they understood what the forgiveness of sins was and at that moment they just stopped what they were doing and they worshipped God. You see, as Jesus enters into the city of Jerusalem, he's not only fulfilling Old Testament prophecies, but we see that there was spontaneous worship. Now you know the story, this is a fickle crowd in just a few days, the same ones that were praising him would be yelling to crucify him. Let's continue reading because we see something else. Notice in verse 39. But some of the Pharisees among the crowd said, Teacher, rebuke your followers for saying things like that. You say, Brian, what was going on? Well, not everybody was happy. Not everyone was pleased with what was transpiring. As a matter of fact, the Pharisees were angered that Jesus was receiving praise. The Pharisees did not want to believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and they certainly didn't want him to receive any praise or adoration that would make him look like the anointed one. So here's what the Pharisees do. They look at Jesus, and basically, here's Brian's translation. They say, Jesus, tell them to stop. Especially when they're saying, son of David. The Pharisees say, Jesus, Jesus, tell them to stop. They can't be saying that. Tell them not to say that. Jesus, tell them to shut up. You allowed to say shut up in the pulpit? Tell them, tell them to shut up. Tell them to be quiet, Jesus. They're not allowed to say that. I love verse 40. There's no way we can even begin to comprehend the magnitude of verse 40. Here was Jesus' reply. That the Pharisee said, Jesus, tell them to stop. And Jesus said this, If they kept quiet, the stones along the road would burst into cheers. Hey, hey here's what was taking place. The disciples might not have planned this worship service but God had planned this worship service. God had planned this worship service from the foundation of the world. And Jesus is saying, you know what? I can't make them stop. But even if I made them stop, this worship is destined. It's been planned by God. And why the rocks would cry out. And the rocks would worship me. Because I am worthy to 
be worshipped. You see, God not only wants man to worship him, but all of nature has been created for the purpose of worshiping God. Jesus is so worthy and deserving of our praise that if it was necessary, the very rocks could sing out. Here's the idea that I wrote in my notes. All of nature is ready to cry out in worship and give Jesus praise. Here's a question I wrote down, kind of examining myself that I would ask you. Will the stones have to replace you in worship? You see, J Jesus was saying, if you don't worship, the stones will. You see, creation was designed for the purpose of worshiping God. And not only were you and I designed for the purpose of worshiping God, but all of nature, all of creation was designed to worship Him. And Jesus is basically saying, if you don't just do what you were designed to do, then nature will step up and take your place. Why the stones would cry out, Jesus is worthy of our worship. Let me show you a fourth thing today. The fourth thing is this. Jesus is entering Jerusalem produced tears. Boy, it seems like there's just a huge turn in events. Notice verse 41. It says this. Jesus is still coming into the city. But as he came closer to Jerusalem, he saw the city ahead and he began to weep. Boy, the, the, the tone shifts from from celebration to crying. Why the attitude moves from, to, from, from triumph, it seems, to tragedy. Jesus was just receiving praise. He was just being worshipped. And as he makes his way, and I, I've been there in Israel, as some of you have, and as he made the way around that curve and, and maybe was looking up towards the eastern gate, instead of celebrating, it says at that moment that Jesus began to cry. And Jesus made this statement, how I wish today, but, but that's, a, that's a prophetic word right there because we already talked about how Jesus knew that it was this day that he would fulfill that prophecy. How I wish today that you of all people would understand the way to peace. But now it's too late and peace is hidden from your eyes. And then Jesus himself makes a prophetic announcement. He said in verse 43, before long your enemies will build ramparts against your walls and encircle you and close in on every side. They will crush you into the ground and your children with you. Your enemies will not leave a single stone in this place. Why was Jesus crying? What was Jesus saying? What did Jesus see? Jesus wept because he knew that they had missed out on real freedom and real peace. See, all of this was transpiring somewhere about, if you're a, a date person, somewhere around A.D. 33. You said, Brian, did what Jesus say, did it come true? History tells us that 37 years later, after, after a Jewish uprising, after a Jewish revolt, the Romans came in. The Romans, first of all, besieged the city and attacked the city. And by 70 AD, the attackers had broached the outer walls of the city and begun a systematic ransacking of the city. The assault culminated in the burning and the destruction of the temple that served as the center of Judaism. Jesus being able to see not only the present, but Jesus being able to see the future, being able to look in and not only hear the praises of the people, but be able to see their hearts. Jesus looked at them and basically was saying, boy, I wish you could see what I see. And even though there is external celebration, Jesus says, my heart is broken because I know the condition of your heart and I know what is coming. History tells us that in victory, the Romans slaughtered thousands of Jews. 
Of those spared from death, thousands were enslaved and sent to toil in the mines of Egypt. Others were dispersed to arenas throughout the empire to be butchered for the amusement of the public. The temple's sacred relics were taken to Rome where they were displayed as a a sign of victory and the temple was destroyed. And so as Jesus walks in, everybody is celebrating and Jesus is crying because Jesus knew what was about to take place. But there's a second thing that I wrote, and it's the last phrase in verse 44. It says this, your enemies will not leave a single stone in place because you did not accept your opportunity of salvation. You did not accept your opportunity of salvation. The New King James says it this way, you did not know it was the time of your visitation The NIV says, you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. You see, the Jews were celebrating because they thought they were about to be physically rescued. They were about to be physically redeemed. And they missed the fact that God was in their midst. Remember we talked about that last week when the Pharisees asked, when is the kingdom coming? And Jesus looks at him. I can see him. He kind of shakes his head. He says, the kingdom of God is already among you. I'm here. You're missing it. It's me. I am the king. And you missed it. And now as Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem, his heart is broken. Because he sees people that are celebrating for the wrong reason. He sees people that are looking at him with the, through the wrong lenses. They view him as a liberator. They do not view him as a savior. And Jesus looks at them and says, my heart is broken. You've missed it. You've missed the opportunity. You have missed God in the flesh. Here's the question that I asked as I read through the passage. The question is this. Not only did Jesus cry for them, but is Jesus crying for you? Is Jesus crying for you? How many people in this day and age, though they don't physically see Jesus, they're presented the message of the gospel, and yet for one reason or another, they turn away from the message of the gospel, whether for them it's not time, whether for them it's a lack of belief, whether for them it's that Jesus hasn't fulfilled their expectations, but for one reason or another, they don't accept Jesus for who he is. And they miss their opportunity of salvation. Reminded of the words in the New Testament that says, For now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. So today is Palm Sunday. We celebrate the day when Jesus was gloriously received into the city of Jerusalem. We celebrate the day in which the people worshipped but their worship was empty. Their worship wasn't real. And we need to be careful that we don't commit the exact same error. That you and I don't sit back today and raise our hands in worship and shake the palm leaves, as it were, and say sweet things about Jesus. But on the inside, we really haven't embraced him for who he is. On the inside, we haven't accepted him as our Lord We have not accepted him as our savior. And for us, just like it was for the Jews, the triumphal entry became the untriumphal entry because Jesus ended up not saving them, but they ended up being condemned because they had rejected him. So the question today is this, have you received Jesus? Have you received him sincerely? Have you received him genuinely? Have you embraced him for who he is? See, just as it was for the Jews, today is your opportunity. Today is your day of visitation. 